guys, welcome back to The Struggle, the Deska Academics, and Wayno here. How you guys doing? What's good? I feel good. How y'all feeling? All right. He doesn't look as excited as he was yesterday. I know, right? What? What's up? You had so much I'm energy yesterday. Why are we still calling it The Struggle? <sighs> you didn't get the email? You were watching Everyday Struggle no. <laughs> here, on, here on Complex. <laughs> <laughs> um, yesterday, we talked a lot about Nicki Minaj, Cardi B, and uh, Joe Budden. Seems like Academics has a little update for us today. Oh, yeah, I, I actually, um, you know, uh, well, apparently Cardi B watches Everyday Struggle. Um, not the struggle, Everyday Struggle. So anyway, Cardi. and um, she just wanted to clarify a couple of things because, you know, I, I made the point yesterday to say that, um, at least in the motorsport drama, that it seems that Nikki got bullied. And, you know, she just wanted to, like, kind of just even ask me what I, what she should have done. You get me? And, and if that's really bullying. She also denied that she ever told Atlantic or ever use her influence at Atlantic to make a Nikki record not get cleared. Again, this is, these are her words. If you want to believe it, you could or not. And then she pretty much said, you know, um, you know I, I know I personally leaked a song or leaked a version of the Motorsport record where the name drop was mentioned. And, and she was saying that there was multiple versions of that record. And when she heard it, because I think, I don't know, have you, you we talked about it before, right? Right. The, the line that was in the record was like, if Cardi's the QB, I'm Vince Lombardi. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I think anyone who knows sports or, yeah, I mean, just metaphors, it. people are like, that's not a diss. Yeah. And um, words from the horse's mouth, she said, she took it as a diss because when she heard it, the line that followed it um, was disrespectful. Yeah. And, and and again, um, it's multiple versions of the record, uh, apparently, but she said the line that preceded that was, Bitch, you my son, go sit on a potty. Now, that line is still in even the final version, I believe. But that line comes towards the end of the, the verse. She said when she heard it, she heard that line with the name check. And then she heard the following, Bitch, you my son, go sit on a potty. That does seem disrespectful, if that's how it went down. And she said literally she just wanted her name off the record or she wasn't going to be on it. And, of course, you know, yes, she, she her, her husband, or future husband at that point, um, is his song. So, of course, yeah, they're going to try to get Nikki to change it, and she did. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't, if that's the case of how it went down, I thought more of the bullying was in terms of don't clear none, none of her records, but she's saying she ain't got nothing to do with what Atlantic, and especially that Uzi record said she ain't got nothing to do and couldn't control when and how a Uzi record comes out for another artist if they're featured on it, and, and she vehemently denies that. And basically she said her only role in that was saying, hey, just remove my name from that bar because I take offense to it. Mm. Espionage wow. academics. <laughs> you know what I mean, my man went and did his homework. I wonder if anyone involved with the creation of this song even enjoys the song. Do they all just cringe when they hear the record come out now? Can you imagine? Who, who produced it? I don't even know. I think it's produced by Murder. Murder hit me yesterday. Murder's like, yo, you got some inside. Yo, this is like digging up 20 cents. <laughs> I'm so over Two motorsport. Two years later, that's I'm what I'm so saying. Over. It's hard to even enjoy the song now. It's like, but it, what's crazy about it is it's not like a song that you would expect any of this to come from. Like, who cares? It will man? go down in the history books. Yeah, All right, man. Maybe, look, this is hopefully the end of, of the drama. It's been a lot of back and forth. I can't believe it's been going on for two years now. It's right. pretty crazy. Oh, but she also did acknowledge some of the things that, you know, like we talk about. She said she's trying to, like, mature and grow up and not be reacting to as much the stuff as she does, like going right. back and forth to people. So... You know, um, she admits that, you know, she, she loses control sometimes and yeah. responds. In Cardi, you're human. I, but, 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 I think I would do the same shit. I can't imagine all the things people say to her online that we don't even see. So yeah. I understand. I don't judge her for it. I know some people do, but it's like, you're human. Yeah. It's going to take you a while to get used to this, you know? I hope it gets easier for you, though. All right. Um, shall we move on now? This ASAP Rocky case was dragging on for weeks. It felt like we didn't know what the final verdict was going to be, but it's coming now. So um, Swedish authorities have found him and two members of his entourage guilty of assault, but there's not going to be any jail time. They're just ordered to pay the victim $1,300 um, split between the three of them. So really nothing. The victim originally wanted $16,000 in damages. So they basically determined that Rocky's actions were not in self-defense. Um, pretty minor fine here after locking him up for many, many weeks. $433.33. You did that math in advance or you just did that in your head? I did it in advance, I'm not that <laughs> But um, yeah, that, all that, like all of that for this is ridiculous, yo. Like, that's ridiculous. I, I wanna know if like, 
they, they, are they gonna try to ban him from coming there, or is there any gonna, gonna be anything with with him being able to perform in that? I wonder if he would ever even or... want to go back. I would ban them. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't go, but I mean, that nigga does all types of fashion shit. I don't know what he was there. Sweden big on fashion. I don't know, but isn't it in the circumference <laughs> of all that other stuff that where they do fashion? Anytime he says the word fashion, it just feels unnatural. Just... Isn't it in the space of where all the other stuff is though? Stop it, radio. Point. We gotta get you know. a map. I we gotta I get a little point. globe. <laughs> Listen, if. If you see me in Sweden, I ain't there by choice. Okay. No, I mean it's Paris. <laughs> Paris is big for fashion. Paris fashion is, is huge. Street? I think they do London as well. I mean, it's, it, how far is it? None of them are too far away from each other. But no, Sweden is not known for their fashion. Guys. What, for? what is Sweden known for? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I want this today, country. Well, I can't. <laughs> I, I will say though, on a serious note, like this whole thing confuses me, right? Um, two weeks in jail. It was this big thing about like. Um, flight risk, right? It ends up only being um, pretty much a minor fine. Right. You know, we saw the pictures leak. We saw, I think, even another video footage leak, and and the, the pictures of supposedly the guy's injuries did look a little gruesome. So, if you kept him in jail and was making it seem that serious that he could have faced like six years, right? How, like, I don't know what type of from the injuries I saw. Thirteen hundred dollars can't cover that medical bill, so I'm like, damn, wh why the fuck did you even find him guilty? I, I feel like this decision was more to appease all parties that that were interested in it. Right. And one to me was the U.S. government. I think they were trying not to get little nigga by the U.S. government because they were pretty much saying, yo, free our guy. Like, yo, yo what are you guys doing? Mm -hmm. But again, you got to stand your ground and, and and have your process go through its due process. And I think the only favorable result was that, hey, all right, we're not going to like throw him in jail for forever, but at least it's going to validate why we locked him up. Mm -hmm. And it validates why we locked him up with the guilty verdict, mm -hmm. but also it doesn't like bring it and escalate it because he's not getting more jail time. So I, I think this was really a political decision more than anything. Mm. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I think Rocky was really caught up in something that um, may have been way bigger than him. Um, after it became much public. Stay out of Sweden, my nigga. Stay Do you want me to show you where it is? I feel yeah, like I need see. to I show you here it. on a map. It's okay. like, it's north of Denmark and Germany. It's like next to Norway. It's in like a semi-isolated region, not that close to the UK, so we know he likes to spend Wait, a lot of time in one. London. Yeah, I can't believe you guys have no idea where. I ain't looked at a map in a long time. I've been to Norway before. <laughs> it's an interesting place. What's, yeah. What are they known for? Uh, salmon, Norwegian salmon. They fish, they fish a lot. No, no, but I mean, Ikea is from Sweden. You know what? They're known for Scandinavian style. It's like that very minimalist, like clean, Ikea's nice wood look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I never knew that. There you go. A little fun, little fun fact that. for you guys. At least we all learned something from this. It gets me any one of them countries, man. I ain't there by force. I'm being brainwashed or kidnapped. All right, I can do Or set up. <laughs> all right, man. Um, so this week in hip hop, Two Chains dropped a phenomenal album uh, based on a true story, aka Boats, came out August 14, 2012. Uh, there were a lot of cool features on this: Wayne, Drake, Kanye, Nicki, and more. Production by Southside, Mike, Will, Sunny Digital, Hit Boy, and others. Some big singles from this album, including No Lie featuring Drake, Birthday Song, and I'm Different. This debuted at number one. He sold 147,000 units first week. Nominated for Best Rap Album at the 55th Annual Grammy Awards. It's very specific. Um, do you guys feel like this album had a big impact? at the time and also aged well? Absolutely. I, this was one of the most anticipated albums that year. I mean, well, um, 2 Chainz dropped uh, True, it was it, True Religion. Mm -hmm. That shit had like everything on fire. And then remember he had like guest verses with everybody. I, yo, when I think about 2 Chainz's career, I don't, I think I would want to have a career like him. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, kind of starting out slow, not as fast, getting up your respect and getting to the highest moment and still being appreciated. But like this, this album, um, definitely remember exactly where you were when it came out, right? It's a lot of a lot of bars on here, a lot of bars. Do you think I? I, I think it was a nice way to kind of cement a great run by him. Of course, like you know, like I, I think for people who were familiar with Titty Boy, mm -hmm. and of course we saw like kind of the if, at least if we're paying attention, mm -hmm. some of the branding changes that he was making to get to the point that he dropped that that mixtape right before, which I think that makes it a classic. Yeah. Um, this shit was just, the singles were all over the place. Like, he was unstoppable. You get me? I mean, he had the record with Drake. Mm -hmm. um, the song with Kanye. Those two alone, yeah. crazy. And then, of course, I think the I'm Different song, that shit just hit different, mm -hmm. to be honest. 
So honestly, if you had to ask me, I would probably say like in terms of impact, probably one of the most impactful albums that year. But as it grows or like as the year passes, it stands the test of time. It, it, it probably is a classic album. I'm going to just say probably. I, I hate to mention it because what, <laughs> what I've realized about this classic argument you, now, yeah. classic argument is what it means to the person more than to the person. actually judging like song by song. So. I go for Nicki got one of the funniest lines on this album. <clears throat> on on a, I Love Them Strippers record? Yeah. We tell Tiger, looking for the position called Black China, taking mm-hmm. a bitch in a hot flash, middle plus hot flash. <laughs> I, th- I just always <laughs> think that that line is hilarious, yo. Taking a nigga bitch in a hot flash, minute pause, hot flash. Well, I fuck with this album, OD heavy. I fuck with this album. This is, is, is this around where he did the Made in America performance? Were you there for this? I feel like you're usually out. Remember there was like a year Good Music performed and it was really dope. Oh, Kanye came out, yeah. stumbled over his lines and I think like 2 Chains finished it or something. I feel like yeah, the, the whole few years surrounding this album was really dope. It was like a very fun time in rap. He was on Rapix Live, we got him like a booty cake for his birthday I think. He was <laughs> he was not amused really. Not <laughs> I amused, think but... it was just maybe a bad day. Um, anyway, shout out to 2 Chains. Shout out to Chains man, hell of an album. I'm gonna listen to this today. All right, so we got one more album for this week in mm-hmm. hip-hop. So Chinks, his debut album, Welcome to JFK, was released because it was following his death, unfortunately, on May 17, 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, so the lead single was called On Your Body. Um, yeah, so unfortunately this dropped uh, after he died, but how do you guys feel about this project from Chinks? Yo, it's, this shit is bittersweet, and I always say that because Chinks, I feel like for a lot of time he was battling with like finding his sound, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like r- really battling with finding his sound. And then by the time he got to this, it's like he figured everything out. Like he figured every single thing out. And unfortunately, you don't get your roses until it's too late. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, this this was definitely a, a dope album. Um, specifically, I say in New York. You know, I didn't. I, I can't speak for a lot of people <laughs> outside of New York because I know they didn't get a chance to reach too far. But like. In New York, like this was definitely a moment. I mean, I, everybody was happy with finally, with, with hearing Chinks finally get to where he wanted to go. Unfortunately, it came at his demise. You know what I mean? But definitely one to remember. I fuck with that album. You know? Yeah, I mean, again, I ain't even gonna sit here in front like I was like a huge Chinks fan in terms of his music when he was alive. But I used to hear him in doses, and I I enjoyed what I heard, um, especially from French. Mm-hmm. But I, I I know like when this did come out, like I, I reflected on you know it, again it's a, kind of a bittersweet type of moment because he passed away. I remember he passed away on my birthday. Damn, I remember, bro. Like when when I woke up and I was like, all right, man, my timeline is gonna be flooded. And everybody was like, yo, somebody got shot in New York, and you know, um, just one of those I think tragedies in hip hop that you kind of always remember. Mm-hmm. And I think with the album dropping and even just find out more about him and even re- revisiting some of the old stuff and and seeing how he moved and how he kind of like really held it down, mm-hmm. uh, you kind of feel like he got robbed of his, his shot. Absolutely. You get me? You also feel like he probably would have, he's not one of them niggas, like there's a lot of rappers, you're like, they probably wouldn't have went to the next level. It felt like he had a true shot. Yeah. And um, that makes it even more sad of a story. But uh, again, Rest in peace of strings. Yeah. He had a lot of co-signs too. Like yo, Thugger was fucking with it. Like a lot of people. It's, it's just like that that moment when everybody like it, it kind of like like the Nipsey shit. Like when when you finally get your moment. Like how he got the the drink with John Legend. It was like about to be so big for him. Like even with this, like he had so many records like that could have just took him and propelled him into a different level. Even they was jacking his lingo to yay. How everybody was saying that. Mm-hmm. Like he could have. He was changing like the sound. <clears throat> excuse me. He was changing the sound of like New York music to where it's not just the typical boom bap, like he was creating a new sound for it. So, you know, rest in peace to Chinks, but this is definitely a dope album. All right, so now let's get into a little game of verses where we decide who had the best verse on a song. And uh, you guys have been really good at sending us suggestions for this, which we really appreciate. If you want to keep sending those, uh, we're on Twitter at Everyday Strug with two Gs. So we're going to start with Lil Yachty and T Grizzly on Once Again from QC's upcoming compilation album, Control the Streets, Volume 2. Who had the better verse, Yachty or T Grizzly? Wait, no. Hmm. <laughs> All right, so I ain't gonna front. This one was <clears throat> like a little tough only because they was going back and forth a lot. Mm-hmm. And I know that like when people go back and forth, they usually not write each other's bars, but they kind of like share what they're going to do in order to get to the next space. But I fucked with Yachty a little bit more than T Grizzly on this. Not not that T Grizzly ain't bring everything that he always does, but just like it's always surprising to hear like Yachty rap. Like not not trying not dissing them or nothing. I just think like 
for how Yachty's perceived when he does say some shit that you fuck with you, like wild by it, you know what I mean, every time. So I mess with Yachty heavy on this one. Um, I'm going with Yachty as well. Like, I, I think I think just it's one of the hidden things about Yachty. Like, Yachty has worked on his flow. He's worked on actually being able to say some shit. And, and I think he, he went through this phase of trying to prove to people that he almost had to kind of like think back to himself what why people like him. Mm. Not everybody wants to hear him try to spit or like spit a bunch of bars. And I remember shit, I've had these conversations with him, was like, hey, sometimes people just want those melodic songs from you. You don't have to be trying to like, oh, I could rap, so let me sh keep showing y'all. And you know, like uh, when, he, when he dropped like Summer Songs 2, I think like he kind of showcased it. Like I think his core fans more, more like hear it a lot where, hey, he'll have a couple songs. Like he had dropped this, this song called uh, um, for Hot 97, where he was pretty much dissing him, but mm -hmm. yeah, Yachty could rap at times. Again, I know when I say somebody could rap, Wayno starts thinking he could rap like not, nah, no, nah, but <laughs> no, he could rap. That's not true. But but I do think him and him and T Grizzly, they have a great chemistry. I think T Grizzly brings out brings him to a higher level um, where he's rapping at a higher level, mm -hmm. and they have other collabs. I think that's happened, but I'm going with Yachty on this one, yeah. and. Obviously, you could tell it's kind of starting to heat up that whole QC uh, movement because they're dropping the, the compilation tape. And I know Yachty, Yachty always is down for singles where he's like showcasing his rapping skills. Mm. So I fuck with it. Yachty, yeah. we miss you. Yeah. When is he coming back up here? It's been so long. I think it's time for a little reunion. I ain't mad at that. All right, so our next one is from Joyner Lucas and Tory Lane. So this is Suge, the remix of the Baby's track. Uh, I dropped this last week. They're going back and forth for about six <laughs> minutes. I love when you guys are like mind-bendingly, <laughs> people are mind-bendingly rapping on songs. You get super excited about it. So, uh, Ak, you want to take this one first? These niggas, yo, I think the <laughs> beat got tired of them niggas. Man. Like, these niggas was rapping, rapping the air out of the booth. Uh, but honestly, I'm going with Tory Lanez. Mm. Like, I, Joyner, Joyner almost got him. I'm not going to lie. Like, after I heard Joyner, I said, Joyner knew what he was doing. Jordan knew what he was doing because you know some people gave Tory the the win in their little back. Tory and forth. gave Tory the win. Yeah, but but let's not act like nobody agreed with him. Okay. You know, right? And I think Joiner was like, "This is the way to kind of get him back." And I love the fact that both of these dudes were kind of like they had sudden shots at each other. Mm -hmm. So after I heard Joiner rap and almost be out of breath for about like three minutes, I'm like, okay. Tori's about to do his thing, and then Tori's just fucking wrapped the air at the booth, man. Like, right, this thing was going, going to stop. What's going while, on? While I, while I love Tori Lanes, and I think that he did a phenomenal job, like I <laughs> would say, academics is wrong. I go with Joyner Lucas, and the reason why I go with Joyner Lucas is because that nigga set the tone. I feel like he put the pressure on Tori Lanes to have to do all the extra shit so people can think that he, he got him on the record. Hmm. I go with Joyner. I mean, sometimes I rock with the tone setter, but I'm not even gonna lie to you, man. This nigga, this nigga Tory hit about 15 different flows. That doesn't <laughs> mean that he had the better verse. I'm telling you, he had 15 different flows. He's like, he went double time, quadruple time, like he was going crazy. He was trying to do these playoff words. Again, I don't know. I, I really want to see the recording process for both of these guys doing this shit. Yeah, they could do a whole documentary on it, but I'm happy that they did this shit together. Mm -hmm. Like, that was the next thing that they could have done. Like, you know what I mean? They, there was nothing else for them to do but this. But that was dope, that was dope. I think people gonna fuck with that and remember it, but I go with Joyner. All right, so tied for one. Disagree. Number three is from ASAP Rocky and Tyler, the creator. This is Potato Salad. So this one dropped uh, July 2018. Mm -hmm. They're going over Monica's 2003 song called Knock Knock, uh, mm -hmm. produced by Missy and Ye. Um, so we know how you feel about Igor. Not the same way uh, Wayno and I feel about it. How do you think Tyler did on this song, Ak? I like when Tyler raps. Mm -hmm. I don't like when Tyler, like when I'm listening to eerie music with a bunch of beats. <laughs> you feel me? Like, Tyler's a good rapper. <laughs> oh, Tyler smoked this thing on this shit. <laughs> Tyler smoked ASAP Rocky, and and you know I'm glad ASAP Rocky is of course free, and I'm ho glad he's not going to be spending any time in jail and everything. But let's be honest, man. As soon as I heard Rocky repeat twice, uh, it ain't a purse, it's a satchel. I was over it. I was over it. I said, I said, Tyler, you got this, bro. <laughs> you get me? And 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 I like how he was kind of also piggybacking on, like um, the the was it the garden, whatever. Was was it, remember that song that Tyler had? Y'all remember this shit? This the little garden shed shit, like he did. Y'all gonna read that? What recently? 
No, it was on like the last album, the Flower Boy, uh, Flower. Flower Boy joint, where he was like, he, he kind of brought up like at the end of his verse. Mm. Yeah, the Garden Shed track. He kind of brought that up and kind of like mixed it in with. Wow, like, look at academics trying to tie yeah, like, it to bodies of work fuck? and shit. You're so. I'm just saying, sometimes. man. He smoked him, and I rock with Rocky, but he smoked him. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> Rocky did keep up, but Tyler, I think that Tyler, like, because everybody views him as this weird dude, like mm -hmm. they don't respect his raps and like the shit that he did on Funk Flex. Like he trolled the whole time. Like he did that to <laughs> just fuck with Flex. But Tyler can really rap. Like people got to start giving him his, his respect um, because he makes airy music with a lot of beats around. It doesn't mean nah, that's, that's one album said. though. No, that's one album. See, <laughs> okay. see, like I'm not gonna, I'm not. Yo, I still have hope that Igor is gonna grow on you, even if that's how you feel about it now. It's still really dope. Just appreciate it for what it is. Just like I appreciate Cardi, although I never know what the fuck he's saying. You heard what, did you hear what, what Khaled said? I like words. <laughs> <laughs> I like words. I like shit to, that's gonna make people dance. Coming okay. from you, that doesn't always make sense. You like rappers who make sounds on songs that no right. one. It's a different language. <laughs> I don't know. You only speak one language, academics. What's... I don't know what the fuck, like that's what I'm saying. I don't know what. That's why I understand why there's no compromise with Playboy Cardi speaking the language of swag. Stop it. The language of swag? Now look, Playboy Cardi is, that's one thing I can't say. The nigga is dope, but I don't know what the fuck he be saying. But Thug is like that too sometimes. Like it's sometimes when he say shit, I be like, what the, f I don't know what he's saying, but the shit sounds fire. Like, that ass. Thug's dropping a new project tomorrow. I'm so hyped. I I'm doing a Thug or appreciation segment on my show on, on Beats this week. He got a was hype. He has so many hits. Yes. Thug could do like a hits concert. Absolutely. That I would go to and have a fucking great time. I want to see how this album sounds for, from Thug, just because I feel like you know he's been having success on the executive end, and sometimes that might be like that might make you not want to focus on your music as much. Well, I think it's weird he's calling this his official debut album. I'm gonna consider Jeffrey and like is. Barter Six. Yeah, yeah, but I mean Cole is involved, so yeah. let's see, let's see. Let's see. He's the executive who focused on it. Let's see. All right, so we got a fast break segment for you guys. Today's fast break artist is Pop Smoke. He's 20 years old from Brooklyn. According to XXL, he actually started rapping after sitting in on Jay Guapo's recording sessions. Then he started sneaking into the booth to record his own raps. So he dropped a couple of records late 2018, MPR and Flexing. So both of them got some regional love. Uh, but early this year, he had his breakout track called Welcome to the Party. Over seven million views on. YouTube. He's also gotten some love from people like ASAP Ferg and Rich the Kid. Says 50 is one of his biggest influences. And in July, he dropped his first full length project, nine track mixtape called Meet the Woo. What do you guys think of Pop Smoke? I fuck with Pop Smoke. <laughs> Why are you so, so hyped for that? Okay. Nah, I fuck with Pop Smoke. You gotta say that. He's from New York. Nah, it ain't, it ain't cause that. I fuck with Pop Smoke. So there's no yeah, bias he's from here. Brooklyn. You know what I mean? But, but I fuck with Pop Smoke. I think, like, what's crazy is Pop Smoke got a song. I don't know the name of it, but he sound exactly like 50 Cent. Like, it's so crazy. Like, if you listening to it, you really wouldn't believe it was, it's, it's not 50. Like, that's how much it sounds like him. But the first song I heard was Meet the Woo. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, that was a couple months ago. Meet the Woo, NPR, Money, Power, Respect, and of course, Welcome to the Party. You know what I mean? Like, that's been the song in New York, the song of the summer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, but I fuck with Pop Smoke. I, it's it's going to be interesting to see if, like, he can keep going only because he has this crazy distinctive voice, right? But I don't think his skill level is up there with the people who have distinctive voices, like a Jada Kiss or a Lloyd Banks, mm -hmm. where Banks got a real, like, deep, groggy voice, but his skill level is just, like, super elite. Pop is not, like, that on a lyrical tip, but I think he's good at making songs. Like, he's good at getting straight to the point. That's what I like about him. I fuck with Pop Smoke. I told, I remember, I told you about him. I told you about I'm, him. I'm surprised you compared it to, like, Jada. And, and, like, no, just the voice, because he has a distinctive voice. That's what I mean. Hearing him... Like so, so there's this new. This is the first hit song that's come out of this new wave of New York drill music. New York is, is doing drill music now. Right. Not now. Been doing it. Well, it's it started with Bobby Schmurder, bro. Like, come on. Nah, nah, nah. Like, I I do I, I separate that because I feel like that was more that was imitating the sound of like even Chicago. I feel like New York has its own organic, which is more, which is not only influenced by Chicago a little bit, mm -hmm. it's influenced by even the UK. Because when you listen to this, and like if you listen to Chef G and shit yeah, like that, like, fuck with Chef G. like you hear the UK influence in how they even sound. Right. You get me? So um, that's what I'm saying. Like there's this like kind of new, uh, a new New York drill movement going on. And, and this is like the first certifiable hit out of it. A again, I understand Bobby Schmerner and other rappers who have, you know, made hits, but mm -hmm. I don't look at that and be like, oh, that was New York drill. I think there's well, a underground New York drill movement, and this is it. 
I, I, I like this song, Welcome to the Party, and really, I didn't really like it at first. I was like, this shit's garbage. I gotta be honest. <laughs> but it's one of those things where you see how other people react to you, you're like, oh, this shit's a hit. Your intern? It's yes, yes. No, I was in the goddamn club when I met Casanova. And that shit, this shit came on, I thought, I thought the whole club was gonna collapse. It, rem- <laughs> it reminded me, and of course, we're in New York, so and, it, and the club was a little bit too ratchet. Keep in mind, I met Casanova in there. Come on. Anyway, it, it felt like how, I'm like when Chief Keith comes on the club or some shit okay. like that. Felt like the whole shit was about to collapse. So I realized that there was an energy with it. You know, I, there's some dope lines in there, which I kind of like, and people quote it to me all the time. So I've kind of grown to like it. I'm watching him as his career goes on because, you know, uh, the EP or was it a, was it a yeah, mixtape? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you know, or whatever, the project. They all kind of sound alike. Like, they all sound like that, that distinct sound, but he has a distinct sound. Mm-hmm. I think how he goes about kind of separating that and making sure he's not only known as the meet the meet the or no welcome to the party guy mm-hmm. uh, i think that'll th- that'll be the the thing that that d- determines if he stays or not yeah. but right. right now he definitely has a buzz mm-hmm. and a really organic buzz out of new york yeah i fuck with it and for me also when i see an artist buzzing in new york there's mad shit that popping in brooklyn or queens or whatever the fuck and it don't pass the George Washington Bridge, which right. means niggas outside New York just don't give a fuck. Like, they nobody, like a lot of niggas who think they're popping in New York, niggas in Texas Well, that was it. what it was for the first couple songs, but this one, you feel like people outside of New York has a wider reach? Or I, still I think, just... I think, to the party got a reach. No, yeah, I think it's crossover where people in other parts of the country are fucking with him. So that's what I'm saying. Okay. He's someone you have to look out for. He's going to be a factor. All right, Absolutely. check out Pop Smoke. Right now, we're about to make a sharp left turn to R&B for Bryson Tiller on our On The Clock segment. So, of course, 2015 was a big year for Bryson. He popped out with uh, Don't. That was a lead single from his album Trap Soul. That project did really well, considered one of the best of the year. He got a Grammy nomination for it. Then he followed up. A couple years later, 2017, his sophomore album came out, True To Self. It was a number one debut, sold about 107,000 copies first week. And then that year, he was also featured on Wild Thoughts with Rihanna. That was a big look for him. Uh, so in late July, he released a new song called Blame on his website. It's doing pretty well on YouTube. And there are rumors that he might be dropping another album this year called Serenity. What do you guys feel about Bryson's momentum since he came out? Um, would you put him on the clock? Bryson on the clock for me. And honestly, it, it's by his, his own doing. Um, because, you know, I, I think his first project, Trap Soul, everybody loved. And it really put him in a space, and he was being compared to the weekends, and you heard some of the Drake compa- like you you heard him compared to people who had catalog and legacy in the game so far. So of course you're waiting for the sophomore album, and you know like kind of even like but the weekends kind of like that a bit. He's not that all in your face. Like he puts his music out. You don't really see him doing inter- interviews and shit. I think, shit, we're trying to even come every day. Show. Niggas trying to do it on Skype. <laughs> you get me? But I think the second project was a letdown to a lot of his core fans. And I think that fucked him up. Mm. Again, th- this is just my assumptions based on how I saw, like, he, f- he felt like he just kind of dipped out the scene for a while. And he wasn't even that present to begin with. Mm. So he dipped out the scene after that project, which I, I liked it. I liked it. I think a lot of people were expecting, when you, when you drop a classic album as your debut, right? And Trap Soul to me is a classic. People usually expect a high quality record or, or it's higher than normal in terms of what they're expecting for your second project. And um, some people felt like he didn't deliver. And because of that, I think he put himself on a clock because out of sight, even with R&B, is out of mind. And uh, I think... It's been how many years since he's dropped the last project? Two? Yeah, two. about 2017. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's ticking. I, Do we still care? It's ticking. Happy to call, hear you call an R&B album a classic, though. I don't think that comes up a lot in our conversations here. <laughs> right. I think the biggest problem with Bryson is, is like, his seclusion from everybody. Mm-hmm. Like, because it was like he wasn't doing features with nobody. That that hurt him as well. But it it also like comparing him to Weekend. At least Weekend was consistent. We didn't know what the nigga looked like when I first heard Weekend. I thought he was a girl. You know what I mean? On House of Balloons, on certain songs. But at least we the nigga was consistent with dropping shit, dropping shit, dropping shit until he started to get to the bigger records. Mm-hmm. Like Bryson, he dropped. It's like kind of crazy seeing that that shit came out in 2015. It seems like yet not that long ago. 
But 2015, we talking what, four years later now, going into 2020, we still haven't gotten like a full length project that can be comparable to Trap Soul. He on the clock. Yeah, yeah he's definitely on the clock. I wish he wasn't. The reason why I don't want, I, I wish he wasn't on the clock is because he's made super talented. Right. Like he's one of the most talented artists there is, but I mean, I don't know. I mean, he dropped this one record, but I, I think that with, with him not, Working with a lot of his peers, that that's what hurt him as well. Because I would love to have heard a Bryson Tiller and a Boogie record, or by now a Bryson Tiller and Drake record, or you know, there's so many different people you compare him with. And now, like, it's it, when you're chilling, other people's moving along, and once they get popping, they're like, oh, "All right, that nigga ain't want to give me a feature. I don't want to do nothing with him now." I he thought, might not care, but I, I, I thought he was, you know, I thought he came in and swooped in and. You know, you know, Party Next Door, who has gone through his own inner turmoil and his own problems, whether, as some may allude, with drugs or just, just like personal conflict in terms of writing for other people in terms of put, a, and putting stuff out. Mm -hmm. I thought when he dropped Trap Soul, he kind of almost just swooped up that lane, and I thought I thought people wanted to see him run with the flag, like right. yo, they did. this is this is your lane, and you about to just outdo everyone in that lane, and kind of fell back. But again. We can say it's kind of the same thing about Party Next Door, who we also put on the clock pretty much, too. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know. See, this is the mysterious shit. That's why I was like, this is the real mysterious shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like, what? I, I think that Bryson, another thing is, this is just my own synopsis. I don't know him personally. I've never met him. But I think that, like, he just don't fuck with the industry. Like, just as far as, like, how it is. Because he's a really, like, to himself type of person. You know what I mean? Like, he's really big on his family and all of that. And that's cool, but, like, this is, a you know, your business. This is your your way of means. And I think that as talented as he is, he should be way more further than he is today. Yeah, know? it's definitely hard to balance that if you're shy. But look, it's like you said, more consistency and also some collabs could help. Frank Ocean is Wait, a, I believe that nigga's shy. A, unicor a unicorn. Oh. Do you ever see Bryson, Bryson out and about? Do I don't even yeah, know I, shy is the word, but think about like a Frank Ocean. He's not really out here either, but he dropped a lot of music and he did a lot of big. All right, so maybe well, I'm using I don't the, think it's shy. The right word. What what I did know is like I know Industry that he shy? didn't like, uh, because his shows used to always be dark, and that's because I heard he like, I guess he had a problem with his skin or some shit. He didn't want people to see him or whatever. So it's like, I just think that he don't really fuck with this shit. Like, don't get me wrong, like like. As dope as he is, bro, like for him to not have records with nobody, for him to drop a body of work that was such appreciated, everybody was remixing this shit. Fab did one of his records over to the point you thought it was Fab's record. All of that. For him to not have like no records with nobody, not even no real affiliations. I mean, he did this shit with Travis. I'm not, let me not say he ain't do nothing with nobody. He does shit with Travis. Or, I mean, and the Khaled thing was a look for him. Yeah, so Khaled. A few more of those. Shit, it was surprising um, to see him on her. That. He did a joint with her as well. Like that. One day I was listening to the joint with him and her, and I'm like. Damn, like, why don't this nigga drop something? Like, he he's so dope, but I I think that he's just like kind of off of everything. I might be wrong, and and I'm just thinking about trying to state the obvious too, because I know we would maybe bring it into the conversation for other artists. Maybe that nigga's just lazy. Mm. Maybe again, you had a lot of success, you know, got all these plaques from your first project, you know, you dropped your second project. I, I'm like. Uh, does he write for other people? Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's, like, what's the driving force? Again, if he doesn't have an, in him, like, mm -hmm. yo, I should be dominating this lane or competing with this person or being in a conversation with this person, maybe he's just cool with not dropping shit. Maybe he's not even the things we're saying. Maybe, but then yeah. you just say you feel like the sophomore album, the reception to it affected him? Yeah, yeah I think it is. Right. Yeah, no, no, I do, I do. Well, that's my thought. But right. also, I don't know how these things work, work ethic is. Right. You know, because sometimes if you are still working even if you're not putting stuff out. Mm -hmm. You're eager to get to the point where you're putting stuff out. I don't be hearing shit about Bryson. Right. That, that yeah. nigga might be lazy. I don't know. He might be. I don't know. Let's see though. So rumored that this album is dropping this year. Hopefully it is. Obviously there's still people checking for his music, right? So let's hope it's a dope album. Everyone I think would love to see him sort of be back and more involved. Yeah, I'm um, still checking for it, but shit, who knows? You're not the only one. You're not yeah. the only one. I want it. I said he had a classic album. No, he had a classic, huge, and I huge. like the second album, man. Yeah. Like, you can't listen to Twitter niggas, man. They sway <laughs> with the wind, man. <laughs> they'll, they'll call you shit trash today and appreciate it four years later. Well, wow, what an amazing segue into our Ooh. big facts or BS uh, topic for the, today. This one is from High Tech, so a rapper, a producer from uh, Ohio. He said, artists, producers, beware. A lot of people are just fans of your success, not your music. It's a difference. Most probably couldn't even tell you more than two songs you wrote or produced.
I, I would say I got to go with the academics half and half. Like, you know what I mean? For real. Like, I, I think that that's... I, with high tech, I, I understand where he's coming from mm -hmm. because high tech has worked on, like, mad albums and he's just not a producer that's, like, He's not just Blaze. Like he didn't have a like this crazy tagline, but he, he to me he's made classics with Talib Kweli and Most Def. He did shit on the documentary on Game First album. He did Running. Like he's he's done a lot of shit. So I, I get where he's coming from, but I don't think that that like that people don't. And he's not saying all people. Yeah. He's saying a lot of people, right? So like Ugly God was talking a lot about the core fan base versus the people who fuck with you because you had a couple good songs and some memes and you know that they're not gonna last forever, kind of thing. What he said was wild though. Like like for a, fi a fan to like try to hurt you and all that other shit. Like that's not a fan. You know what I mean? Insane. But but I I don't know. I I gotta call this BS. Like if I gotta pick one, I gotta call it BS. Only because like I think that um, you know while we don't have a lot of people that are well versed in, in music. And then another thing is people have to look shit up. And motherfuckers is lazy. If they can't click on it immediately and read it, they don't do it. And when you look at a lot of the streaming services, they they usually don't have like that option for the credits. Like I, I say Apple Music specifically. When I was a kid, it was nothing better than opening up a package and reading the credits and reading uh, who produced the songs. Kids don't do that no more. Everything is just click sharing, click sharing real fast. So. It's, it's, it's a little bit hard for them to probably, like, get that information if they really want it, you know? I'm going Big Facts, actually. Yeah? Uh, you know, I have half with me with this one. I think it's Big Facts. I think a lot of people really fuck with the wave, and the wave is usually the success. Mm. Like, I look at artists who I think, quality-wise, they're putting out the same music when they're hot and when they're not hot, mm -hmm. and... A lot of the fans gravitate to them only when they're in the conversation. When they're not in the conversation, it's like, it's like we don't even hear it. Mm. Fetty Wap comes to mind. Fetty Wap's still putting out good music. I listened to the last couple couple of Fetty Wap songs. They're actually good. Mm. But is he hot right now? Nah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody who was a fan of him a couple of years ago, where them niggas at? Mm. Where they at? Mm. But now, now I understand there's other factors mm. that play into it, but you don't even... I don't, like, shit is real quiet for him. And I think it's because a lot of fans were a fan of his movement, that wave, 1738, all cool. But that shit left as soon as they found the next artist. And you have to just acknowledge that sometimes, yeah, you have your core, but a lot of people really just fuck with you for your success. Blueface, I think most of them, most, most of not only, not, not only fans, but even rappers fuck with him. Not for his music, because of how successful he was. Because at one point he was super viral. He was hot. I seen him in the studio with that. I felt like everybody was trying to get in the studio with him. And people said, "Oh, we got a record with Drake. Yo, we got this coming. I got this." Which, by the way, talk to Drake. There ain't no record with Blueface. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so again, I do feel like uh, people sometimes are more a fan of your success mm -hmm. than your music. And I'm not saying that that was the case with like the Drake and, and um, Blueface thing, but uh, I'm just saying there was a lot of people in terms of people who were, who were giving him praises at that point and also fans who were just involved, like, oh, shit, this is like a wave, yeah. mm -hmm. that now they kind of trickle on and move on to mm -hmm. other people. Gotcha. All right. One big facts, one BS. All right, so according to the New York Times, Jay-Z and Rock Nation have partnered up with the NFL to uh, oversee some entertainment and social justice activism. Um, so I'm sure we're going to get more details on this moving forward, but one of the things uh, Jay and Rock Nation will now oversee um, include entertainment for things like the Super Bowl halftime show, which is definitely pretty big. We know that Jay once turned down the opportunity to play at the Super Bowl for obvious reasons, so curious to see what his involvement looks like going forward. What do you guys think about this? Uh... While it's dope, I want to see how many people that, and don't get me wrong, I fuck with Kaepernick's message and everything, and I just, a lot of people I didn't know that what, what we were boycotting football for specifically. Mm -hmm. Are we boycotting it because of social injustice? Are we boycotting it because he can't, because they're not trying to give him another position in the NFL? Mm -hmm. So I want to see how like people react more to this than anything. You know what I mean, but I think it is, this is dope because there's a lot of conversations when it comes to football that people just, uh, say that they're out of the loop in terms of culturally, mm. you know, culturally they're out of the loop. I think Jay-Z could add a lot of stuff to it, but I want to see how people react because, you know, they like the bandwagon shit. 
immediately. Oh no, nah, we right back. You know so. Um, of course y- you. Uh, by the way, Jay Z previously allegedly turned down performing there. Mm-hmm. So the, the mere fact that he would partner with them, clearly there's either promises or understanding that you know this is to initiate a change in culture right. more than just here's an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Right. So again, I do think that's cool. Um, Kaepernick has also been campaigning for for a lot of stuff that, and even filed a lawsuit. I think they gave him a settlement or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, that basically is, is showcasing, I think, the dirtiest part of the NFL that they've been trying to cover up. And even this, I do think it's a cover up. I just feel overall, the NFL owners is really the racist country club mm. people. Right. And no matter how they try to put band-aids on it, and, oh, we'll bring in this person kind of close to us mm-hmm. that they could oversee certain things. Until those faces change, and I'm not saying, oh, just get it. We need all black owners. That's not what I'm saying. Right. Until, it, it's, until that culture is kind of broken up, and we have some new blood in there in terms of owners. Most of these niggas is on, on the team. The thing is, it's so hard. It's like owners are not going to change. But what you realize in a lot of organizations, even if sort of like the CEO is racist, unfortunately, you can't change that easily. But there are a lot of other people in the organization somehow, like sometimes, who are trying to make change. And they could sort of make breakthroughs with that person. They're not going to make them not be racist. <laughs> but it's like, you got to start somewhere. All right. But, 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 but think That's about it. That's what you it. mean, though. But. Like in... Um, in the NFL, they have this thing called the Rooney Rule, mm-hmm. which which is trying to give in. It, it's a rule implemented that you would give um, more opportunities to people of color. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have to do it. So it, I think it's, it, it's with the coaches. So you have to interview at least one uh, minority head coach or coach when you're going through a coach search. Mm-hmm. But you know you ain't about to hire no no black coach now. You, you, you like you know the vibes right. I feel like. It's yeah. like affirmative action. Yeah, it's like one of those things that, yeah, you could you could try to watch it, but if people are feeling a certain type of way, yeah. and especially NFL owners, yeah. which is it's much different than the CEO of a company. These are all billionaire people who they could literally systematically systematically change the change a whole industry, which is making billions of dollars. Nah, you know, do you're Did right. you, but I like what the, the NBA is doing, where they they you know they removed the term owner now, mm-hmm. right? Like they removed that term. So I think that that's gonna spark a lot of different conversations, to, just in sports in sports ownership period, as to how they deal with things. Like 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 you said, it's the racist country club. You know what I'm also, I think just football in general, mm-hmm. th- there is. There, there's a race relation problem there. Yeah. Like, you know, historically, there's been a lot of white coaches. And, and then the some of the players who are black, it, it, especially, you, you know how football big in the South? Mm-hmm. Like, there's kind of sometimes in how they even train and breed some of these players, it kind of feels almost like supplantation again. Yeah, it's pretty. Mm. You get me? And it's different with basketball because, right. you know, basketball is, is kind of like minority dominated in terms of numbers. Mm. And they're looked at kind of differently. In NFL, is seen as, they're seen as expendable. Also, yeah, yeah. shit, they had a motherfucking, like, they, they still don't, they're still saying, we ain't changing that Redskin shit. Like, that, yeah. the Redskin stuff, that ain't racist. Oh, racist like the, to y'all. Re, it Redskin, is tradition to us. When people hit you with Indians. Yeah, when people hit you with that type of shit saying it's racist to y'all, it's tradition to us, right. you should know the vibes. Right. So, yeah. again, I do feel like it's a culture that I think only time could cure it where maybe the sons of these motherfuckers don't feel the same and, right. you know, uh, are a little bit more open and receptive. But I, I do think there's a lot of race. You got to get act on so. CSNBC. <laughs> to Real change man. things. Now you're right. They bring me in, man. It's not, it's not an overnight, but, like, he can have some influence uh, in like Robert Kraft and uh, Jerry Jones. Term change. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys, we got to go. Thank you for watching Everyday Struggle. We'll see you here tomorrow on Complex.